Thank you. I'd like to take a few questions from this side. I know there are at least three or four more on that side. Before I do that, uh, uh, Santiago, the hidden agenda of uh, the foreman lectures is uh, that the audience tries to influence the lecturer. Uh, and uh, 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 although you declared yourself an uh, international bureaucrat, uh, we don't buy that. Uh, you're an internationally respected opinion leader and policy maker. One of your points was that uh, if you were to redesign today, you would keep the household's incentive as they are, but you would add an early childhood nutrition component to that. Let me um, ask uh, John Hardinot, who was uh, deeply involved in the evaluations of the study, and he and his colleagues do work on early childhood nutrition, um, to come in after a round of questions, which I will um, ask to uh, uh, be addressed to, uh, to Santiago again. Um, uh, if you were, uh, John, um, and anyone else who may like to speak to that, uh, to, uh, to give a message to, uh, uh, to our lecturer, how should that component of early childhood nutrition look like um, embedded in, uh, in CCTs? Um, and uh, what's the take-home message there, uh, not just for Mexico, but maybe elsewhere? Hands up on the left-hand side, please. Judy, you go first. Uh, introduce yourself. Hi, Judy McGuire. Um, I um, know that CCTs have been tried in a number of countries, and this problem with the health ministry capacity is always a problem. I think it, oh, it works much better in education than it does in health. Um, in Nicaragua, we saw them sort of contracted out to NGOs. In other countries, they have provided incentives. They call them, IDB calls them supply incentives. That hasn't really worked. And I wonder if part of the problem isn't uh, kind of the um, conceptual framework you're working from with respect to health ministries. Uh, I, I think it's a quality versus quantity issue. Uh, the quality of health care in nutrition I would say it's almost universally lousy. It's not a matter of handing out a food supplement. It's a matter of a quality of interaction between the caregiver and the mom, counseling, and to a large extent going beyond the facility and into the community. So uh, what we're talking about is long-term problems with the sector. And um, I'm not a critic of CCTs, but I don't think... Um, an equally balanced attention has been paid to the capacity, the quality in the health sector. And I just uh, wonder if you can envision how to do that, because CCTs are usually, people want to do it right away. You know, they're doing it right now in a lot of East Asia to compensate for the food and financial crisis. And to get cash out is fine. That's a very good thing. But in terms of addressing these long-term underlying quality issues in the health sector, what do we really have to, to work with. Aside from, I agree on the incentives, but it's much more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, right here, front row. Lane Vandersize, worldhunger.org. Uh, now that you're in DC and have had a chance to look at uh, donor and uh, international institution <laughs> nutrition programs, uh, what would be your, broadly conceived, what would be your thoughts on how effective they are in light of principles that you set for. Okay. Uh, pass it over there. Orange. Hi, this is Esteban Quinones here from IFPRI. Thank you, Dr. Levy. I have two points I'd like you to touch on. The first is the labor market. That's, I think, an important part of your presentation you didn't have time to give, and it's, uh, it's really one of the big issues that's going to confront, I think, all of these programs. So if you could get into a little bit more about the problems with that and what the mechanisms are that you think might actually be effective. And partially, I don't want you to leave IFPRI without stirring up some controversy. So you could go there. Secondly, the point that Joachim touched on, which is early childhood development. In particular, I'm thinking about early childhood education, which needs to be coupled with the early childhood nutrition. Are there any things in Oportunidades or other programs like it that uh, are being implemented to really touch on early childhood education? Because I haven't heard much about it. And secondly, on that 
point. I've read recently about um, early childhood education being done in very remote areas of Africa through tailored radio programming, which looks like it's being somewhat effective. And so is that one of the mechanisms that uh, is, could be used? Thank you. Mm -hmm. And to uh, pass it over here, these two. And Thank you. Uh, Judy was worried about the uh, quality of uh, uh, health services. I'm a little worried about the quality of education services. You alluded to one possible explanation for the uh, lack of impact on learning outcomes, namely that the resources are spread across more kids. What, how, what's your take on Fernanda Reamer's additional concern that by giving the teacher the power, effectively the power to withhold this large income subsidy, that it shifts the, the balance of power between parents and, and teacher uh, even worse than, uh, than it starts. So the teacher's incentive to teach is undermined. Mm -hmm. And uh, forward, and then come back to John and Santiago. And Peggy Parlato from the Academy for Educational Development. Uh, a question about one small element of the program in that you mentioned a couple times that the nutrition supplements were not distributed for various reasons even when they were sitting right there. And I wondered if you had considered uh, shifting that part of the program to the private sector in, a, in something similar to the way food stamps are, are used in, in the United States. Okay. Um, Santiago, uh, in your last uh, set of interventions, yes, uh, I will call on John in a moment. Uh, uh, I was unrehearsed and unprepared. I apologize, <laughs> John. Uh, uh, you mentioned cost-benefit in response to some of the questions. Uh, yes, there is a study from Jerry Behrman um, uh, on the impact of impact studies uh, in the uh, case of, uh, uh, of Mexico. And um, uh, we at IFPRI are interested to, to measure our own impact, and that's why we ask independent people to, uh, to look at that. So... Um, the, uh, not only are these uh, benefit cost ratios very, very high, um, but uh, I'm proud to say for those who did the work at IFBRI that uh, the attributable share of the net benefits uh, uh, to the, um, uh, to the uh, research community, which has, uh, at IFBRI, has done these studies, um, is quite significant, and uh, if you add it up, uh, you could finance IFBRI for several decades from it. Um, but uh, uh, as there are no donors in the room, I feel I can say uh, such, uh, such words. Uh, Jerry Behrman, by the way, is uh, doing another much larger study on the multiplier effects of the great Mexican example. You mentioned Brazil and lots of others. That will uh, hit the uh, book tables next year. John, may I impose on you? <laughs> and then back to Santiago, and then back to you. Um, I think what I'd like to do is the following. Is first of all, is thank you very much for a very interesting and stimulating uh, presentation. Um, but I would like to recast what Joachim had suggested I do in the following, for the following reason. That's how he is. <laughs> um, I actually think you know all these things already. Um, so we're, I'm going to set up a scenario where you have been asked to go and meet with a minister of finance in country X, uh, who is skeptical. Just is that bit better? Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. You're, you've been asked to go to meet a uh, minister of finance from country X, and you know this minister is f skeptical about all these nutrition issues and really deeply dubious about the role conditional cash transfer programs could play in addressing these. So you say to me, as I happen to be wandering by your office, uh, Hodnot, could you give me a one-page memo with some bullets uh, that I can hand on to this minister and his staff? Um, and with that, I think my memo would have two components. The first component is to say, why does nutrition matter? And uh, I would say is that it, nutrition matters in the sense it has both intrinsic and instrumental value. It's intrinsically important that children growing up are well-nourished. I believe that. I, as I'm looking around the room, seeing people nod their heads, I think most people here actually believe that. But we also know that every day people go and see this Minister of Finance and say to him, you should spend money on this because it's important, because it's valuable. 
So while the intrinsic argument is true, it's not necessarily going to be compelling to a minister of finance. So the second component of why nutrition matters is this idea that it has instrumental value. It's a mechanism by which other important social and economic goals can be achieved. This is a topic which we at IFPRI have been doing ongoing work, uh, some of which is based on a very long-term longitudinal study in Guatemala that actually goes back to the late 1960s where a randomized nutrition supplementation trial had been implemented. In its latest incarnation, uh, the work we're doing on this is the following. We have information from that time period as to which children were stunted and which children were not stunted. And we ask ourselves, having gone back and found these people as adults, what has been the impact of being stunted on measures of outcomes in adulthood? And what we find is that children who were stunted in adulthood score lower on tests of cognitive ability in their 30s and early 40s. Along some measures, we suspect there is evidence that they are not as healthy as people who are not stunted. For men, the impact of stunting is to reduce their earnings, that is, the income they earn per hour worked, on the order of 50%. And finally, we have some evidence that children who were exposed, mothers who are exposed to this nutrition supplement when they are very young, have children in the next generation with higher birth weight, birth weight being very important for a whole series of full life outcomes. So in fact, not this idea of there being instrumental value for nutrition is not something which we're just kind of making up and hand-waving, but there's actually solid evidence to support it. Which in turn then says, well, how can we make CCTs more responsive or more effective in terms of nutrition? One area which I think you've already covered quite well is the point about improving household and children's access to food, both its quantity and the quality, and the combination of the cash transfer and, the, and things like the nutritional supplements, the papilla, are one mechanism doing so. But other areas that require attention are improved maternal care practices and healthier environments. And this would be an area where thinking creatively, for example, in terms of improving quality of services, perhaps public-private partnerships, provides other innovations which could be combined with CCTs, could further enhance the effectiveness of these in reducing preschool nutrition, in improving preschool nutritional status. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, is immensely, in, immensely enriching our discussion. Santiago, back to you. There are some people who are really anxious to uh, also raise their points. Uh, we, I think, can take another 10 minutes. Uh, Marie, is that okay, uh, uh, schedule-wise? Yeah. And then there's food and drinks out there. Um, Santiago. So I'll, I'll try to be brief uh, in some of the questions, except uh, I'll take the provocation of labor markets and, and expand a little bit more on that. Um, I'd separate the issue of quality of care in health services from the CCT. Before the program, you had the quality of health problem. You weren't so aware of it because few people were going to the health clinics. The, the gain from the CCT from this perspective is that now people are going to a health clinic and you're aware that they're getting bad services, but at least they're going to a health clinic. So, so the problem is evident and now you have to solve it. So, so the fact that you have bad quality care doesn't mean you shouldn't do the program. It means you should do the program and then try to fix the, the quality problem. Now, that requires, as you say, a lot of rethinking as to what's in it. Um, I would put in the bag decentralization and accountability and stricter connection between budgetary mechanisms and households. Uh, th that's the, a link that's not there in the budgeting of health services. And you think about, you know, uh, public sector departments. And, and that link to quality has not been there. But decentralization and accountability have to be part of better quality um, so that households can actually demand better quality. But at least now you know that households are there and they want this quality. Um, second question, I, I don't know enough about to, to really give you a full answer. My sense, and this is something we didn't talk much about, is that a problem with many of these programs is sustainability. That the, the program starts, it works very well three years, but then the government changes, or the health minister changes, and then the, the program is dropped, and then it's picked up again. And sort of, you know this better than I do, you need sort of continuous 
long run interventions to get a, a permanent change and in these sort of short, stop go stop go doesn't really work so my general observation would be make sure when you design this program you're thinking about mechanisms that are going to allow the program to be sustained over some period of time so that it can have permanent effects okay on the labor market basically the problem is my reading of the problem in any case is that the issue of informality in labor markets in many countries is associated with the fact that many social programs are so badly designed that they're generating perverse incentives for firms and for workers to make the choice of formality versus informality tilt in the direction of informality. And this is actually very negative because there's evidence that shows that workers of equal characteristics and abilities are less productive in the informal sector than in the formal sector, and you're punishing their p chances of getting higher wages in the future. Um, the controversial part is in my claim, but, but I believe this, uh, this is true for Mexico, and I'm currently doing research for the country in Latin America, that, in fact, an important component of informality is associated with badly designed social security and other social protection programs, not the CCT. Uh, here terminology fails because people sometimes don't make a sufficiently sharp distinction between targeted poverty programs on households and general programs for workers that don't have access to social security because they're in the informal sector. And they put all that in a basket and that's a mistake. But if you carefully try to see the incentives that are being generated, in my view what is happening is that there are incentives for firm to evade the law and there are incentives for workers to evade the law to go into informality and that is associated with lower wages, lower training, and lower medium terms effects. Um, so on the question of the early child development, um, the only case that I know is uh, Horacio Atanasio, uh, who is a researcher that many of you know, is right now running an, an interesting pilot program in Colombia with Familias in Acción, which is a similar program to Progresa in Mexico, in which he's trying to build on the social capital associated with the families participating in the program, such that the children are put together in a mini daycare center, so to speak, but very, very wrong. And, and the, the, it's, it's very, the scope is basically not to have eight months old or 10 months old, 12 months old babies at home all the time without being stimulated. So it's recognizing the value of toys, the value of interaction, the value of being together. And he's adding that now to Familias en Acción with an evaluation framework. And so that might be a low cost, practical way of trying to incorporate early child stimulation into programs of this sort, which accompanied with a nutritional intervention, um, in principle would have much more punch. Uh, on the education question, um, yes, that was a concern that, in fact, you would tilt the balance of power to the teacher. On the other hand, because the whole community knows the program, and many members of the community realize that the performance of the teacher matters for the household and the welfare of many households in that community, um, what has exposed happened is that it, it didn't really tilt the balance of power in, in, in favor of the teacher. However, it didn't tilt it in favor of improving the performance of the teacher either. And there was nothing in Progresa to improve the quality of educational services. And that's a, that's a, a fault. And, and that's something you to have done. Um, a very quick question on whether we, I would use the private sector. Th I, my sense is a very much a country by country kind of answer. My answer in Mexico is unlikely that would work because you're talking about distributing to 80,000 communities in the rural areas of Mexico, some of which cannot be accessed by, you know, it, it's, it's n the logistical issue associated with distributing the nutrition supplement is fairly complex. I think it would be a, a higher cost option th than, than the other one. And finally, I need a copy of your memo because <laughs> 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 so, so when I talk to the your points are the same ones that I would, that I would, uh, that I would raise as well. Okay, thank you. Um, a few urgent questions, very brief. Please go ahead, microphone right here. We try to circle the room quickly. Uh, 
Thank you. I'll be very quick. I'm Mira Shaker from the World Bank. And two comments, two very quick comments, and then a question. Um, I must say this is one of the most interesting sessions I've heard on nutrition in a very long time. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, just for information, the bank, the World Bank, uh, just approved a $1.5 billion um, credit for Oportunidades in Mexico last week. So that speaks to your legacy that you left behind there. Um, my question is about um, something that... that I believe is different about uh, Oportunidades and Progresa is from other nutrition programs across the world, is that the impetus and the, the conceptual thinking behind the program came out of the Ministry of Budget or, or Finance and not out of the Ministry of Social uh, Development or, or Health or Education, or, though those ministries clearly had a role to play as well. Now, that is not something, that, that's an institutional uh, issue that we don't see happen in many other countries. So it goes beyond engaging the budget chiefs in, in those countries. Um, as new countries are thinking about following up on these approaches, many countries are struggling with this. Should really budget chiefs be engaged? And if yes, how can they be engaged in a, in a productive way? And, and I particularly want you to reflect beyond Latin America to Africa and Asia as well. Thank you. Mary, pass it uh, along on the same row first. There was, I think, a hand up. Thanks. Ladies first. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much. This was a great talk. Um, I'll be brief in my question. One is sort of what happened in communities where like 80% of the population received um, the cash transfer and the others didn't, where I'm assuming there may not be a huge discrepancy um, in income in those communities. Um, and then the second one is for you to you know, think about the future and whether in those places it might not be better to actually deal with the community as a whole and think about subsidies or um, cash that might go into improving the entire environment. I know, for example, in Peru where uh, through Juntos people have to go to the health center you get these people going on payday and lining up. And in fact, if some of those um, code respon the responsibilities could be transferred to the community, um, in fact, there might be the improvement in the quality of attention um, might be better. So anyway, and I'm Marcia Griffiths from the Manoff Group. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Daniel Kotler from the World Bank. And I wanted to uh, echo your comments about the next phase and how it needs to emphasize better incentives for providers and how those need to imply different ways of budgeting and a smarter use of, of information. Um, I'm not a nutritionist um, and I was <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was trying to find what's the best place to learn about nutrition. So I was uh, looking at some data for Latin America and ask which country has done the greatest improvement in malnutrition in the last two decades. And it was Mexico. And I was also attracted to Mexico because different to other uh, programs that have instituted CCTs and that have tried to get rid of the duplication of food programs. In Mexico, you were very careful to keep the nutritional supplement and worked very hard at it. And finally, when I asked uh, what's the best health establishments to visit, I was told IMS Oportunidades, which you led after uh, this, this particular adventure. So um, I'm a great, advent a, a great admirer of what you did. But then when I arrived there, I was surprised at one thing that I just couldn't find done. Um, if you ask people in the clinics, how many of the kids you're looking after have improved over the last year? Or if you ask the clinic administrator, which of your nurses has a, best, a better rate of improvement than the others? Or if you ask the district manager, which of your clinics is doing a better job? Nobody knows. And nobody knows in both in the IMSS Oportunidades clinics and in others. And after that, we've 
try to, to find out if other countries in Latin America manage to have this information, to have a better grip of this information. And they don't. So, question maybe, isn't this the, 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 the clear uh, low-hanging fruit if one wants to impress greater accountability over the work of the health clinics? Thanks. Oh, well, <coughs> can I move over to this side, or is there a very urgent question here? Dare to say you are urged to? Okay. Yeah, please, pass it there. And then a mic, please, to this side. Go ahead. Kathleen Kurz from um, a Academy for Educational Development. Um, thank you for accepting the invitation. We're really glad you did come and give this talk, and it's very good, actually, to hear from non-nutritionists on our, on our topic, so thank you. Um, I guess I wanted to push you a little bit more on, um, on the incentive for agencies, although you may have just suggested a way, um, and sort of if you went to, back to your old job and, and President Zadia said, what would you do tomorrow to give an agency, you know, just give us an example of, of what might be um, a first in incentive to start with, just so we understand that better. And then the other one is, um, uh, there's integrated program and then there's specialized programs and we often go back and forth with the pros and cons of both. So I wonder if you could just speak to that integrated program covers more but then specialized programs say, well, we need to focus on just a couple of things so we make sure to get those things done. And I wonder what your reflections are having run an integrated program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone who would like to come back in? Yes, uh, okay, Santiago, that doesn't, behind the column, in the overflow room, any noise? There are some people not sitting here, but in other rooms and here and see us. No? Santiago, back to you. Well, thanks again for, for very, very uh, good round of questions. So on, on the question of whether the finance ministry should be brought in, my answer would be absolutely yes. Definitely, most definitely. Um, yeah, the question on the question of whether the finance ministries and, and particularly the budget people should be brought in into social policy, uh, my answer is yes, most definitely. There is this wrong view that the budget ministry should say, well, because of the macro considerations, we can spend this much, and then shoves the money out to the other ministries, distributes the pie, and then they each go their own way. Um, there are two reasons why I think this should be done. One is, in many countries, the only ministry that has the coordinating ability among ministries is the finance ministry. So the finance ministry has to understand that its responsibility is not only to pass the budget and control the budget, it has to understand that its responsibility is also to make sure that the education ministry and the health ministry sit in the same table, and sometimes the power of the purse is the only way to make them sit in the same table. Now that's a bit brute. But, but it works. Secondly, it has a deep, needs a deeper understanding, and hopefully we can get that, of the sort of thing that John was talking about. This is economic policy. This is policy about the quality of your labor force. If you don't have even the intrinsic values to worry about poverty, okay, you've got to sit down and tell them you're wasting the productivity of 25% of the labor force. How on earth do you want to compete in the world? if you're wasting the productivity of 25, you know, even if you have no heart and you say, well, I don't care that they're poor, all right? Well, forget that. Just, you know, you want to make the country competitive, okay? You, you're running all these training programs in the labor ministry. Why do you want to run these training programs with people who can't read or who can't absorb? So people need to understand that this is economic policy. And, and sorry to make an ad, but in sort of my last book, the, the whole point of the book is to make finance ministries and, and people in, in general to understand that social policy is economic policy. And so, so the answer is yes. Um, on the communities, two, two very quick points. Um, uh, there weren't troubles with the communities because we ran a validation assembly. So after, there was a point system in which it was a survey and people's assets and all that were, were measured by some uh, statistical technique, but very importantly, there was a political legitimacy to the decision as to who would be in and who would not be in because before the program started, there would be an assembly of the whole community and they said, okay, well, this one and this one and this one are going to be in and the guys were out. And then some of the wives who were out could say, hey, you know, you didn't take, your, you know, uh, look at me and then they would revalue. Re 
but it worked. Separate question, I would make a distinction between transfers to households that are private goods for personal consumption versus transfers to communities for public goods. And I think that they both should work in tandem. And in Mexico we did that. I didn't speak about this, but in Parallel to Progresa, we transferred resources to communities so that the communities would have for public goods, improving the rural road, improving the health clinic, improving the school. And, and you would want both sides to work. But I think one has to clearly delineate conceptually transfers to households because you want to raise their private consumption level, an exclusive good, versus uh, transfers to the community for public goods. Uh, on Daniel's question, yes, it might be the lowest hanging fruit, and I'll try to mix that with a, with a question about what, what would I do. I think we need to understand better the functioning of bureaucracies and the incentives of bureaucracies. Um, and I think the problem has to do with the fact that there's really nothing in it for them because they're not treated as part of the solution. Um, hierarchical orders are given from the minister down to the vice minister to the director general to whatever, whatever, whatever. But people don't know, they don't understand. The nurse out there in the community is not fully informed. We need to find ways of bringing them in, of making them feel part of the solution, making them feel part that their values and their ideas work. And they need to find mechanisms to change the power. And this has to do with unions, promotions, who decides who gets to be the head nurse and who decides who's not the head nurse and the head doctor. It has to do with corruption, who makes the purchases and who doesn't make the purchases. And it has to do with fibers that are fairly difficult but that need to be touched. Low-hanging fruit is curiously hanging very high. <laughs> um, integrated versus specialized, very much case by case. I mean, I I su suppose you go to a country right now and you have this very high indices of undernutrition and you say, look, we, we really need to do something right away. You know, there's all these kids that are being stunted and have anemia. And you say, well, let's do an integrated program and, you know, it'll take three years to put the health clinics here and to build up the capacity and the capabilities and do the service and all that. I, I think we shouldn't do that. I think we should say, look, while all that happens, let's right away try to do something that can help. And the question here is to make it incentive compatible. How do I make the transitory solution be transitory and not permanent? And, and we have a saying in Mexico that says, there's nothing more permanent than what's labeled transitory. Por lo pronto hacemos esto y luego vemos. For the time being, we'll do this, and, and then we'll talk about it, right? The problem is that we never talk about it for the next 25 years. So, so in this specialized versus complementary, I would say, yes, do it, but make sure that doesn't undermine the incentives to do the more integrated approach. I think. Well, Santiago, I'm, I'm sure you have recognized that uh, you have a very high quality audience here um, who would love to continue to ask you questions. Uh, we have seen that there was another lecture hidden in your PowerPoints. You have to come back. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, Santiago Levy was ahead of his time when he started um, the Progressa Oportunidades program. Uh, but uh, he was able to make uh, time catch up with him. I'm sure he doesn't need uh, low-hanging fruits. He can also shake trees, uh, have high-hanging ones come down. Santiago, you are again, I think, ahead of your time with your closing remarks from your lecture, where you argued uh, somewhat uh, skeptical about um, the full potential of CCTs and argued for social moving from social projects and social programs to social strategies. And um, I think that's extremely important. And we would um, next time like to hear more about that from your nutrition strategies as part of so social strategies. Uh, probably in a changed economic environment, uh, part of uh, a social market policy rather than uh, a project here and the market there. Uh, I think this, uh, your ideas uh, need to come to the forefront in the current debate um, 
of the G8, G20, etc., um, where there is um, uh, the social protection component um, trying to help the poor due, uh, due to the current crisis, but then continue with business as usual. That's not good enough, I think. I'm actually quite optimistic about uh, the increased demand for CCTs uh, for however the bad reason. I think out of the current world economic crisis and recession, um, which uh, first undermined uh, assets uh, of the poorest through the mechanism of exploding food prices, secondly through the, uh, the current blow at employment and financial constraints, probably due to uh, overreaching stimulus packages leading to a spike in inflation in the next couple of years, which again will undermine the asset base of the poor. What will be the outcome? A, a fast increasing inequality worldwide, far beyond where we are now. I, I would expect Gini coefficients to jump up over the next two to three years. And then what will have to come to the rescue? CCTs. But Santiago told us, good, but not good enough. And um, I want to thank you for that and for your uh, detailed and visionary talk. And uh, I all invite you now uh, to lunch. And thank you again, Canon, for your warm words and coming with the family. I, I think uh, your son is here already for the third or fourth uh, of these lectures. Six. Oh, yeah. Time goes by. <laughs> and uh, uh, he... Uh, appropriately has shown a preference for nutrition. I hope he's munching out there. <laughs> Thank you all.